Well, oh well, what have we done with the Great Commission? Huh. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Rocks of Revelation being poured out to you. My passion is for you to develop a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Not everyone that says to me on that day, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. You know, we don't want, we don't want to stand there one day and Say, you know, Lord, Lord, we did all these mighty works. We did all this stuff. We cast out demons. We did mighty works. And, 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 you know, we did all this cool stuff. And they'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. So we need to know the spiritual component of our relationship with Jesus as well as the biblical. And sometimes uh, we get off, you know, something we may have a good intention and we get off a little bit and we're like stray a little bit too far from the Bible. And... uh I believe what we're going to be talking about today is something that kind of had some good intentions, and it just got a little, it departed a little bit too far from what Jesus really told us to do in the beginning. But I'm going to deal with some bullet points of what I was thinking about, or what I was praying about. Recently, on Facebook and Google+, Plus, I've been posting some excerpts of things that is kind of ruffling some feathers. You know, it's just basically some facts and figures, and people, they get upset when facts and figures get thrown into their face. Like, wait a minute, that, that messes with my tradition, you know, <laughs> so or, or my theology. And I'm not trying to do that. Basically, I'm just I'm saying, look, like, we need to take a look at this. Like, you know, people, when they run a business, you cannot run a business and ignore facts and figures like dollar signs. Oh, there's a leak here. This isn't working there. This employee's not holding his weight. You've got to step back and look at stuff, get rid of the dead weight, and emphasize the stuff that's working. Now, that makes it sound like church is a business. Well, it is a multi-level marketing program where we're supposed to make disciples the The currency in the kingdom of heaven is faith in the word of God. It says in Acts, and the word of God grew. And it's not, you know, we we think success today has something to do with money. Well, I'm about to show you a bunch of homeless people that were successful. Success defined in the way the the Lord defines success. You can't serve God and mammon. Because if every time every time you try to do something, you think, well, how am I going to pay for that? Well, God's going to do it. That's faith, man. Every time, every time the Lord gives us something to do, we never have the money for it. You know, it's just, it comes out of nowhere. You just know it's going to happen. Uh, George Mueller is a really good exercise. If you read, he's not really contemporary, but he ran some orphanages completely off faith. He never asked for money. He just he would just pray in in the closet and stuff would show up. That's how God works. That's faith. We never need to put the physical cart before the spiritual horse. Now, I've been posting a lot about the sinner's prayer, finneyism, you know, crusades. And basically I've been posting from a guy that I think we all like you know, to a point, you know, I like Ray Comfort, you know, he's an apologist, he goes out on the street, and he starts talking to people about their sin, and he he also has some statistics, and he wrote a book back in 1999 called God Has a Wonderful Plan for Your Life, and he's talking about how the gospel's gotten a little bit kind of watered down, and everybody's making this decision, like, oh, okay, I'll take that. You mean I get a new house and a new car and and all this? And that's not the gospel that Jesus preached. So therefore, whenever he has all these decision cards, uh, you'll see that anywhere from maybe 1%, maybe, stay Christians after their original decision uh, in these crusades or 
you know, saying the sinner's prayer, the mass volume sinner's prayer. And that that's ruffling a few feathers. And that's my idea is not to make people angry. I'm like, say, hey, we need to look at this. These are facts. You know, let's let's see what's going on. And maybe we departed somewhere. What where are we missing? Where are we missing this? That's all I'm saying. Because if Jesus is in it, if Jesus is in it, you're gonna know it. Right? Now, you know, Jesus says you have uh nullified the word of God through your traditions and we need to keep in mind that a lot of the things that we believe, we presuppose stuff even when we read the Bible because of the theology that's been handed down to us for centuries. This is the way it's always been. And we don't question it, right? But the spirit of truth has a way of when you're in your closet, you're reading your Bible, or you're praying, one time, you know, maybe the 50th time you finally read that verse, you may have forgot to put your theological lens on, or maybe the Spirit of Truth will get through and say, hey, this is what that means. You've been doing it wrong, right? So sometimes the Spirit of Truth will just go, hey, you need to know what this means. And I'll give you an example. I use this as an example over and over in my podcast over the years. My grandmother, she said... Uh, before she died, she said, Conrad, did you know angels had sex with women? And I'm like, no way, Mama, that's not true. No way. She goes, well, it's in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 6. And that's when I knew. I read, you know, I probably read it who knows how many times, right? And I'm like going, wait a minute. I missed that. And this is about the time I decided to throw out my TV. Because I realized that I was being conformed to the world, and I was also being conformed to traditions of men when it comes to the things of church doctrine. There's lots of things that are, you know, that we do that we just kind of glaze over if we read something that kind of counters it in the Bible. I mean, seriously, it's like our brain goes to sleep. And that's why God says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. In it you shall meditate day and night, and with it you shall have good success, to Joshua and Joshua 1.8. We, you know, I will hide your word in my heart so that I don't sin against you. You know, and Jesus had a problem with um, the, the Pharisees. You'll notice one of the things is we all go, well, the Pharisees had Scripture memorized. Well, if you real if you look at this, I've been I've been learning this that Jesus is what you would call a Karaite Jew, and you're not going to find that word in the Bible, but I kind of stumbled across this within the last six months. Jesus exalted the word of God over traditions. And when I see that and I'm looking at his discourse with the Pharisees, I'll see that, hey, you know, they're not really they've got some other stuff going on. You know, washing the pots and their hands and and Jesus is saying, that's a tradition, man. So it turns out the Pharisees believe that some things can supersede the Bible. And I, I didn't know that. I just thought, oh, well, they believe in the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament, you know, the Law and the Prophets. And I was like, oh, wow, the traditions crept in. And Jesus had a big problem with that. Now, Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew 28, the Great Commission... That I'm just going to read part of it here, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Behold, I'm with you until the uh, I'm, I'm with you all the days until the end of the world. Amen. Now he's saying, teach people to observe all things what I've commanded you. So whatever he told his disciples to do, they're supposed to teach more disciples. And this is kind of where it's the, the multi-level marketing business. What we're trying to do is be transformed by the words of God. We're trying to become disciples of Christ. That's the currency of the kingdom. The word, you know, uh, if my words abide in you, you can ask what you will and be, it'll be granted to you. You know, the idea is to get the words of God in people. That's success. So now I'm going to go ahead and talk about um, the way Jesus told the disciples to evangelize. And I'm going to read this passage and then we're going to look at it, okay? In Luke chapter 10, um, 
And after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others. I want you to pay attention to that. He sent them two and two before his face into every city and place where he was about to come. Okay? Prepare you the way of the Lord. Then he said to them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may come, that he may send forth laborers into the harvest. Go. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves, carry neither purse nor bag nor sandals, and greet no one by the way. Into whatsoever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest on it. If not, it shall return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking the things shared by them. For the laborer is worthy of his heart. Do not move from house to house. And into whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you, and heal the sick that are in it. And say to them, the kingdom of God's come near you. Now, I'm going to tell you, some of this stuff here is going to kind of cook your noodle, right? And uh, it might kind of go against what you've always been taught. You know, we're supposed to have crusades and get decision cards. and But what did Jesus say? We're, he's teaching his disciples to teach other disciples to do what he taught them to do, whatever he's commanded them to do. So here is a way that they evangelize. Now, a lot of people may go, well, wait a minute. In Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people were saved. Well, that's one instance, and we don't want to make our doctrine out of an exception to a general rule. Look at the way Paul traveled. You know, he had the missionary journey. Right? He was homeless, kind of like these guys. He stayed in prisons and in people's houses, right? And God provided his needs. But let's see, here we go. It says, And the Lord appointed 70 others. Now, I want you to understand, these are 70 other disciples other than the first 12 apostles. So there's proof there that other people are supposed to do this, other disciples of Jesus. And he sent them forth two by two. And when, you know, when Susan and I go out, it's awesome because there's two of us. Um, she helps me and I help her, and it's awesome. We go, by, we go forth two by two into every city and place where he is about to come. The way we work on that is we pray. We simply pray, where do you want us to go? Now, we're not perfect, okay? I'm not, I'm not saying that I do this exactly. But uh, let's just look at this and see what we can learn from it. Now, this is something that you might not know. Th- then he said unto them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he may send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, the the Greek word for send forth is Greek 1544, which is ekbalo. It means to eject, literally or figuratively. Bring forth, cast forth, cast out, drive out, expel, leave, pluck, pull, take, thrust out, put forth, or send away. This is the same Greek word that is used in Matthew 722. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name? Have we cast out devils? So they're driving them out. Do you understand? So let's think about that for a minute. In the King James, it's like send forth, but the original Greek is much more stronger. You got to cast out these people out of the buildings. Now, the rest of the, um, the rest of the, the passage gives the context. And if we look, we can see that, you know, these guys are homeless. He says, don't even take a purse or scrip. You know, just go, and when you get there, you're going to stay in a city. Well, a lot of us have this mindset that we're going to paint the building and have a nicer program, and we're going to do all that, and people, sinners are just going to come in. Sick, you know, they're just going to come in the building. And, dude, I'm going to tell you what. Sinners coming into a church is about the same likeliness as criminals just walking into a police station. It's not going to happen. And that's why Jesus says, pray the Father will send forth laborers into the harvest. And I'm thinking about that. As I'm thinking, the persecution, you know, we often say persecution 
furthers the gospel. Well, why is that? Because they're cast out of their comfort zone. You know, it it had to spread like that. So all this persecution, if it didn't happen, we'd be sitting in our homes, we'd be sitting in our buildings, and we wouldn't be evangelizing. Then he says, Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. A lot of us don't personally evangelize because we're afraid we might get our feelings hurt. I mean, you know, oh no, I'm not, I'm worried about my, the opinion of man. You know, we're we're more worried about looking stupid to somebody than we are about being approved to God. And lambs among wolves, Jesus is telling us that he's going to be with us. I'm with you even till the end of the age. So as we're lambs among wolves, guess what? The shepherd's going to be with us, amen, during this whole time. So, yeah, I'm not there yet. I mean, I'm not perfect, but this is what the Bible's saying. I'm saying, you know what? We should start aiming for this. Lambs before wolves. We need to let our ego just kind of go bye-bye. Because we're got, you know, Jesus has given us a command, and we don't want to stand there and say, you know what? I didn't do what you commanded me to do. Then he says to them, carry neither purse nor bag nor sandals, and greet no one by the way. Now, carry neither purse nor, nor bag nor sandals. Basically... I believe that this is simply a reflection of faith. You know, mammon, Jesus says you can't serve God and mammon. We're always talking about how we're going to finance this endeavor, how we're going to finance that. And if God's called you to it, he's going to pay for it. God's will, God's bill. It's something I've just noticed. I've noticed that that's happened. I'm like, going, you know, if I'm hearing from the Spirit of God, when Jesus says, you know, when you're when you're praying to your Lord in secret, you know, or when you're standing praying, believe that you receive, well, God's going to give seed to the sower at that at that point. You're going to say, Lord, what's your will in heaven that I may manifest on the earth? You'll notice throughout the entire Bible, nobody was able to do it in their own strength, or they wouldn't be able to say it was God that did it. You know what I'm saying? Did, did Moses part the Red Sea? Or, you know, that was impossible. He's standing up there, and God's saying, stand and watch the salvation of the Lord. So he, all he had to do was believe God. Amen? So God will always make a way when there seems to be no way. And we need to stop worrying so much about financing things, because if God called us to do it, it'll be taken care of. Then he says, and greet no one by the way. And that just basically shows the importance of it. Um, I heard Wigglesworth, I'm reading something about Wigglesworth. He took that verse seriously. He wouldn't, if he was on a mission from the Lord, he wouldn't even greet people. Because that that could be a way of getting deceived. Now, I don't want to major on that, but that, for some reason, Jesus said that that's important. So then he says, and whatsoever house you enter, uh, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace be there, your peace shall rest on it. If it not, it shall return unto you and remain in the same house. Now today, you know, we believe in having a nice concert, uh, you know, going out and, and uh, lifting up the name of Jesus, which I'm all for that. Right, But here Jesus is saying, go to people's houses in a new city and stay there until your job's done. Then he says something interesting. If the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest on it. It shall not return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking the things shared by them. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. So, guess what? If we seek ye the kingdom of heaven first and his ways of doing things right... Just like this passage says, we don't have to worry about food or drink or raiment with what with all we shall put on. Our needs will be taken care of. And Jesus says, if we're this is our pay, it's food and drink, not sixty million dollar jets or ten million dollar mansions, right? Then he says something else that's interesting do not move from house to house. So I kind of believe in it, and this is me, you know, I'm not saying this does save the Lord or anything like that, but that's kind of how you make disciples. Remember how Paul in Acts chapter 16, he met Lydia, or and he would, uh, he would disciple them, he would stay with people, and he would talk about the Word of God with that same house until his mission was done. Then he says... Um, and heal the sick that are in it, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. Now, Jesus was bruised for our iniquities, and by his stripes we're healed. 
you know, Jesus has paid the price for healing. And a lot of us try to come up with ideas why, well, why people aren't healed when we're praying for them. I'm going to personally work on the idea that it's unbelief. You know, I know that there's all sorts of reasons people get sick, but Jesus basically didn't deal with a lot of that. He healed them all. We need to venture out on faith and actually pray for the sick people, right? Because Jesus died. You know, he was bruised for our iniquities. That's the stuff on the inside. And by his stripes, we're healed. I mean, do we believe that? And when people are healed, it's the dinner bell for salvation. Now, I also want to say, I'm not perfect on this, but I see the Scripture. Jesus is the way. He's the compass heading. And this is kind of like a blueprint for evangelism, isn't it? Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, I'm excited about it. And hopefully, hopefully we can learn something together on this. You know, let, let's get out. Let's talk to people about Jesus. Let's pray for the sick. You know, not because, you know, I, I'm going to say, let's not do it um, if we see somebody sick and we refuse to pray for them. I kind of feel that maybe we're doing something wrong. You know, Jesus said to pray for them. He said, heal the sick. Anyway, I'm still working all this out, but I do see something here. I do see that many people are in these crusades, and they're saying a prayer, or they're raising their hand, or maybe blinking their eyes or something. You know, is that the power of God into salvation? You know, and then after that, we're not discipling it. And why? Because we're putting all this work on one guy called the pastor. He can't do it all. We're disciples. You know, we we need to go out into the harvest. What we're doing now is we're painting the barn, we're going in the barn, we're jumping up and down in the barn, and we're like, Lord, bring them, bring the crops into the barn, let them grow legs and come on in. When he said we're supposed to send laborers into the harvest, the harvest is in the world. God loved the world. He said we're sending laborers into the world. So we need to go and and talk to them and share the gospel with them because they're not going to just stumble in to the building. Amen? God bless you. If you've learned something, or if you're, you know, even if you have a a contrary idea, you know, I I welcome it in the spirit of brotherly love and iron sharp and iron. But this is just something I see, and I I wanted to talk about it and uh, see what you guys think. God bless you. Thank you for being in my life. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.